And we're off. Hey, everybody, welcome to the Mr. Teacher, Mr. Preacher podcast and YouTube channel. This is Kevin. That is Jake. I am the teacher. He is the preacher. And we are here, as always, to learn what lasts in athletics and teach it, pre teach and preach it back to you. We are in our fifth and final installment of our series of self-control jake we're on self-control this is number six block in wooden's pyramid of success practicing self-discipline and keeping emotions under control good judgment and common sense are essential this has been one of the most convicting series of all um of all of them just because nobody's perfect and having uh top-notch self-control uh throughout life no matter where it finds you is, is ultimately very hard um, today, we're going to be diving into Jocko Willink's Discipline Equals Freedom. We started with Ryan Holiday. It feels right to finish with Jocko. Um, I make no promises on reading like Jocko as we go through this episode. <laughs> but before we introduce some of the key concepts, who Jocko is, if you have never heard, which would be surprising, um, and just kind of getting a flavor of his personality. Jake, great to see you. Uh, would you kick us off? Bless this episode. Bless this time and we will get rolling good to see you brother man certainly heavenly father thank you so much for this opportunity to uh discuss self-control and discuss human nature and uh, our psychology and, and trying to draw out the most we can out of the silly thing that you gave us called sport um i thank you for kevin i thank you for our audience i pray that our time would be edifying that uh good things, wholesome things will be drawn out of this conversation. Uh, and I thank you for people like Jocko, who are willing to um, sacrifice of themselves for our country and for freedom. Um, well, thank you. Again, I just thank you for this opportunity. and give this time to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I thought of a fun place to start. Jocko uh, really oh, needs huh? putting the glasses on. We're getting like oh. there's like this studious glasses on. We're getting into it, y'all. We, we are. We are. I'm supposed to wear them all the time. Um, and I may be in a little bit of denial. I didn't grow up with glasses. So maybe we'll do the professor look. We'll do it. It's good. <laughs> there's just some attitude. Like as those things are approached, there's like an attitude. There's just an academic, like, I'm on it now. I yeah. It. Okay. So I'm going to. 20 you IQ see, points higher instantly. <laughs> instantly. Who knew? They are real for the record. They are not fakes. Um, but who is Jocko? Uh, he really needs no introduction. He's a former Navy SEAL. He's now an author, podcaster, businessman, um, echelon front of the business, Jocko Fuel, Jocko Publishing. Um, really came onto the scene after he appeared on the Tim Ferriss show, I think way back in 2015. Um, I highly recommend if you are a parent or a coach, Way of the Warrior Kids series. Um, really interesting um, how a Navy SEAL, Uncle Jake, you know, teaches his nephew how to just become tougher to be a warrior kid. Um, very well done, very well written. My kids love them. Um, so I recommend those. Um, but before we get into the book, Discipline Equals Freedom, I want to go back to just the just the flavor of Jocko. And that appeared for me, yes, in his first, you know, public uh, podcast on the Tim Ferriss show. But where I thought would be best was actually it when he appeared in Tools of Titans. So he was featured and some of his selected answers um, were in Tools of Titans. I just want to read a couple of them to you because this is probably why Jocko caught on so quick. So Jocko, uh, had several sections that I just I just had to laugh. So here's a couple. If you want to be tougher, be tougher. If you want to be tougher mentally, it is simple. Be tougher. Don't meditate on it. Uh, these words, this is Tim speaking, of Jocko's help one listener, a drug addict, get sober after many failed attempts. The simple logic struck a chord. Be, being tougher was, more than anything, a decision to be tougher. Uh, it's, po it's possible to immediately be tougher starting with your next decision. Having trouble saying no to your dessert, be tougher. And I love that Jocko just goes straight to the point. I mean, I get that there's all this emotional garbage we get into, um, but nonetheless. Another one is a good reason to be an early riser. So if you follow Jocko on any social media, he often takes pictures of his watch of when he wakes up. I wish I 
could sleep or uh, run on as much sleep as Jocko does. So he's up and getting after it by 445. And there's even a 445 hashtag on Twitter of people, of people um, copying Jocko. And the other one is, is uh, there's two more. Um, Jocko really doesn't get into caffeine. I know his company now sells energy drinks and his famous white pomegranate tea. Um, but I think this is hilarious. It, I laughed when I heard this um, live. Um, but he said, during his, my first deployment to Iraq, we did longer patrols in the vehicles, and I would have, in a series of pouches hanging in front of my seat, a flashbang grenade, and then another flashbang grenade, and then a flag grenade, which is the great grenade that kills people, and then another flag grenade. And then the next three pouches were Red Bull, Red Bull, Red Bull. Tim, but you're an intense guy which is meant as a compliment. What are you like on three Red Bulls? Jocko. More Jocko. (laughs) What does that even mean? (laughs) Um, um, Quick takes. Golly, because these are funny. And then we'll finish with a spirit animal. Quick takes. You walk into a bar. What do you order from the bartender? Water. What does your diet generally look like? It generally looks like steak. What kind of music does Jocko listen to? Two samples for workouts, Black Flag, My War, Side B, in general, White Buffalo. And then Tim Ferriss, bless his soul, tried to get Jocko's spirit animal. Tim says, I gave this a good try. It went on for a while. The closest I got was Jocko's wife's suggestion. She felt like his spirit animal would probably resemble Motorhead's Snaggletooth logo. Worth Googling. Here's part of our text exchange. Also, uh, Tim, what is your spirit animal if you had to choose one? Could also be a plant or mythological creature. Jocko, negative. What the hell is a spirit animal? Uh huh. Oh, you're in for a treat. Um, the only thing I'll say is like Jocko got called out by Peter Atia that he could do 70 strict pull ups. And uh, Peter said that to a crowd, and Jocko quickly interjected and said, No, I can't do 70 pull ups. I can do 67. Like, for God's sakes, Jocko. Okay. <laughs> So that's an idea of kind of Jocko's personality. We'll put tools of Titans away and we'll get to that. Jake, any reactions on your encounters with Jocko, Jocko brand, Jocko stuff, um, or even just something that we just read? Uh, Yeah, he's a no nonsense guy for sure. Uh, It's a, it's a different mindset that people absolutely need to be subjected to and hear uh, because there's a lot of power behind it. Um, For me, probably the most, influential thing that i've heard is along the lines of you want to be tougher so be tougher um we often sit and dwell on things like oh how do i be tougher and in what ways can i do things to be tougher you know you just have to make your sit you just have to make decisions that's what you want to be and then be it uh oftentimes we don't we don't do that uh we we like to dwell and (laughs) it's almost like well we're discussing it so we're getting there it's like no that's that's not how it works so uh, I love his no nonsense approach. Uh, I've heard him on a couple different podcasts uh, appearances. Um, so I'm not a devout follower of, of Jocko, but I, I certainly love his approach to life. And um, <clears throat> yeah, I, <laughs> there are some things, right? Like the waking up at 4:45 bit. It's like, gosh, wake up at 4:45. I'm like, I could go to bed at nine and waking up at 4:45 I, I would be tough. Um, but then again, I also have five small children jumping all around. So that sleep is vital, but um, yeah, it's not that he's, I'd, at one time he's like, well, he was asking, do you ever take a nap during the day? Sure, sure, you know, I'm feeling a little tired or whatever, I'll, I'll take a nap, which is okay, well, what does that mean? <laughs> well, you know, I'll just lay down, I'll put my feet up above my heart and you know, about 15 minutes I fall right asleep, wake right up, completely refreshed. Jeez, this guy even brings new meaning to the power nap. Uh, so I'm excited to get into his thoughts and feelings on self-discipline because he's got a perspective that is very interesting. I think there's a lot of useful stuff to draw out of it. I agree. And he is more or less like a, a self-control or discipline ideal. And, and and we'll realize how he – it's not like he just got this way. We're seeing this at mastery level. And I think what we're all laughing about is is we all wish we could be more Jocko, if we're really honest. Maybe we don't all want all the stuff that came with it, because um, that would require his same experiences. Um, but I am positive that there has been much positive change 
because of him. You know, he is something, and I know he, he's very clear that he's not perfect. Um, but the amount of positive change we've seen from him. So discipline equals freedom. Let's go to the book. Um, get it if get it wherever books are sold. This was the hardest book to highlight because Jocko is in black, dude. Like, how am I supposed to highlight a book that has is in black and in his famous font, whatever the heck it is? So I went with a Sharpie and it worked okay. And a highlighter. Sharpies and highlighters was the secret here. But the way this book is broken down is it has a thought section and an action section. And then there's portions for repair and maintenance workouts and, and the like. We're going to stick to the thoughts section because that's where some of the key themes really came out. Um, I might be wrong on my math. I taught English, so leave me be. But it was about 62, 61, 62 thoughts sections. Very similar to the way a marketer Seth Godin writes, so like these little mini devotionals or sections. Um, and we pulled our favorite ones, and we're going to talk about several of them. But I want to talk about the meaning of the book that Tim really gets at. Discipline equals freedom. So what, what does that even mean? And here was Tim's take from Tools of Titans. He said that, among other things, that you can use positive constraints to increase perceived free will and results. Free form days might seem idyllic, but they are paralyzing due to, due to continual paradox of choice, like what should I do now, and decision fatigue. What should I have, have for breakfast? In contrast, like Jocko, something as simple as pre-scheduled workouts, active scaffolding around which you can effectively plan and execute your day. That This gives a greater sense of agency and feeling of freedom. Jocko adds, it also means that if you want freedom in life, be that financial freedom, more time, or even freedom from sickness and poor health, you can only achieve these things through discipline. So it's one of those like backwards laws from Mark Manson's. Like it seems backwards, but it's true. Commitment and constraints. So Jake, kick us off. Where should we start with Jocko um, and finding more discipline and self-control and the freedom that comes with that? Well, let's start off right off the bat, the way of discipline. Seems like a good overarching way to start this whole thing. All right. So I'm going to read portions. We'll talk about them and we'll go from there. I will not read like Jocko and embarrass myself publicly. So the way of discipline, this is the way Jocko starts the book. He says, like, people look for the shortcut, the hack. And if you came here looking for that, you won't find it. The shortcut is a lie and the hack doesn't get you there. There is no easy way. There is only hard work, late nights, early mornings, practice, rehearsal, repetition, study, sweat, blood, toil, frustration, and discipline. Discipline. It's the root of all good qualities, the driver of daily execution, the principle, core principle that overcomes laziness and lethargy and excuses. Discipline defeats the infinite excuses that say, not today, not now. I need rest. I will do it tomorrow. There is only one way, the way of discipline. That's the hack. It makes us stronger, smarter, faster, healthier, and better. So if you want true freedom, you need discipline. Talk to me about the way. Way of discipline. Honestly, that strikes me as... <laughs> let's take a test. Okay, let's take school, right? There are the kids who get A's because they stay up all night, study and study and, and memorize all the things they have to memorize. And then there's the kids who figure out essentially an efficient and quick way to cheat. Both got to the same result. We have immorality, obviously, in cheating. Mm -hmm. But is there discipline involved in doing it that way? Or is that just laziness? That's, you rhetorical. Think it's laziness? That's rhetorical. That's rhetorical. It's totally lazy because you're missing the reps. Right, I I think if you if you don't put in the work, you're missing all the that industriousness that we originally. And I'm not saying go the long way. I mean, we talked about working smarter versus working harder, way beyond way back in industriousness. But no way. I mean, there's no way you're disciplined because what happens when you can't do that? Are you going to always look for the shortcut? Is there a but, discipline to always finding the quickest way? Dude, you're disagreeing with Jocko off the front <laughs> bat. Dang it. Like, I mean, I thought we would at least get a couple topics in. Um, in fairness, you disagreed with him. I did. I yeah. don't think we're disagreeing with him. No, I don't think okay. we're disagreeing with him. Okay. I think there is something to be said for working efficiently or working quickly or finding quicker ways to do things. Ultimately, I think his no-nonsense approach, if you want to be tougher, 
it'll be tougher, is a quicker way than what people would take to become tougher. So I think we, we both agree with him here. I would just simply say there is a level there is a level of efficiency that can be achieved where you actually work less than somebody who's working harder in an ethical way and still achieve the same discipline. That's my only point. I'll, I can I can see that. Look, he's spot on. Uh, right? There's there's yeah. you you're you're what we're talking about is um no, I can't place the terminology. Um, immediate gratification is what we're talking about, right? Versus yeah. delayed gratification. You have to have discipline um, to achieve delayed gratification. And delayed gratification is always worth it. I could be wrong on that, but it certainly seems like a an always situation. I'm going to pull up something, and I'm not going to pull it up on the screen, but I'm going to mention it that I saw. I don't know if I shared it, but... I think to to your point or to the point overall, sometimes we don't know when something's going to hit. And what I mean by that is there's a cool post I saw recently. Somebody talked about um, like songs and when, you know, what percentage of them become hits and how few of them actually do. Here we go. It's Noah Kagan. Golly, Million Dollar Weekend Man um, came out with it just this year. He said Drake had 133 songs and 38 hits. That's a 28% hit rate. Beyonce, 89 songs, 22 hits, 24%. Red Hot Chili Peppers, really digging deep. 265 songs and 13 hits, 4.9%. So, you know, when I read this or when I encounter it, yes, I 100% agree with you because I'm a huge Paris fan and, you know, 80, 20, all that good stuff. Um, Because I that's how I'm wired. I'm an average, you know, small size athlete i don't i can't out strength out run out this i gotta find another way otherwise i'm not gonna be on the field much less perform well but when i see this it's like you know everybody wants just to write 13 hits without doing 265 songs and i think jocko's both more or less mm -hmm. yeah. so i just was amused by those 70 percent of their output is not popular Meanwhile, yeah. you wrote, write one blog post and give up immediately. So <laughs> maybe this will be the episode, Jake. This will be the first episode. We talk about Jocko. Who knows? We just maybe. I mean, hey, if there's it. anything to go viral on the internet, it's some bozo trying to play devil's advocate against Jocko Willink. Yeah. <laughs> just for the sake of it. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I, we're we're on the same page. We're on board. I'm playing devil's advocate to kind of poke the bear, um, and do our athletes out there. Uh, let's let's take a, a real life example here. Um, baseball in the late 1990s, uh, you got Mark McGuire, Sammy Sosa. Uh, that moves into Barry Bonds, and then those are kind of the big three. All around them, you have increased home run hitters, increased output, and you have what we now know as the PED um, kind of era that people are going through. It created an amazing flash in the pan especially for you know, guys like Mark McGuire, who wasn't a bad baseball player before, right? Oh. Uh, or Barry Bonds, who was, I still think, PEDs aside, was one of the best baseball players of all time, one of the best hitters of all time. Um, and they had that amazing flash in the pan, that amazing run. I mean, you go look at the 2001 stats of Barry Bonds, just like the intentional walks, the walks versus the home run, it's just insane. Um, it's the closest now, I've ever seen athletics to being a video game. Yeah, no, You're absolutely. Stupid. <laughs> absolutely. But now looking back on it all, the reputation, um, Hall of Fame possibilities. Now I'm kind of on the plane that they should be in the Hall of Fame, but that's another another debate for another show. But you see, they, they went the instant gratification route. They had the flash in the pan. It was awesome in those moments. And then that season, and now here we are, 25 years later, um, reputations are tarnished, um, and they're viewed in a much different light than they were. So I think it's a great example of how instant gratification has really high upsides for a really short amount of time when you take that short route and you're not focused on the self-discipline long-term play. Yeah, and I'm usually not the succinct one, but shortcuts don't last. Mm -hmm. They just don't.
that's it. I mean, really, do, you done however you want to categorize that. Shortcuts don't last. So um, when we look at you know what lasts in athletics, yeah, no, not shortcuts. <laughs> yeah, no, you're you're on the shortcut. You're feeling really good about life, but eventually you have to get back on the track. And it always seems like you know you get back on the track, and shortly shortly thereafter, someone gets a blue shell and blows you up because you're in the lead. <laughs> it brings you back to brings you back to the back. So that's a that's a Mo- Super Mario movie <laughs> reference, everybody. Blue shell blow up. Yeah, Mario yep. Kart. No Mario escaping Kart. that. Absolutely. I'm Absolutely. gonna totally I'm gonna totally meme that at some point. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so discipline is a long, hard road. It's not it's not an easy thing to do. I think it's important that we acknowledge that. Uh and we'd all agree. Um <clears throat> How about the why and and shame attached to it or not attached to it? Yeah. So I was amused that this came right out of the front of the book. So he talks about the way of discipline. And then this next section, number two, was why. And I'm glad he started here. It's one of those, you, we get this image of Jocko and then we get this. And it's it's a contrast that is almost like record stopping. Oh, so Jocko has been asked over and over in this section, you know, why, why are you so driven? What drives you now? Um, And initially it was because he was going to meet an enemy, like on the battlefield, right? If you got an opponent, somebody, you got an opponent and you may face him on the battlefield or the, the, the game field and and you're going to be ready for that day when you meet that person right on the other side of you and you're going to be as ready as you can be maybe you won't win every time but you're going to meet them with all the hell and fury you can that's two hell references now three all right good good job kevin so he asks the section i was curious about is the second half he says what drives me now and the answer is simple i'm quoting him the men that did not come home mark and Mikey and Ryan. But it's not only them. There are others, hundreds more, thousands more, countless more, who fought and died to give me the gift of freedom. And for them, I will make every day, every minute, every second, I will make it all count. I will live to honor their sacrifice, a life worthy of the price they paid for me, for us. I will not let them down. And so what I wrote here about the gift was it your why can't be about you i mean it can't be about your career your wins your i mean when i wrote shame why and the shame is is your actions for that day i mean he gets so specific down to you know wake like how he wakes up we say oh how does he wake up it's because he's staring this in the face every, I mean, it's just lording over him. Now I understand it. It's unbelievably sad. I wouldn't want to lose three of my friends like this, uh, especially the ones that I've gone through what he's gone through with them. But the words that stuck out to me were gift and honor, like to honor somebody or something bigger than I don't feel like getting up today. They don't get to get up today. And so he talks about death later in the book. And this is huge. You talk about self-control and discipline. I don't, I don't want anybody to go to this extreme necessarily. I hope you don't. Um, You got to have something more than, than just superficial. This is, this is core Jocko. And it's such a contrast from what we see and we laugh about him. Right. Um, But this is the fuel. And this really is what gets you the miles per gallon is honor and sacrifice and a why that that'll take you as far farther than anything else. So what do you think of having people to honor in your life and, and that sacrifice, whatever that means and, and living a life worthy of that, of worthy of the people who've put into you. Is that, is that the why for our athletes? Is that what we're saying? Our no, I'm not. Is the people that have invested in you, or what? What can we say is a why for our, for an athlete? Because that's that is super heavy stuff. I mean, obviously, what Jocko saw and what he did is on a whole nother level play field ball game 
than you know athletes than sport so what kind of transcendent outside of ourself why can we have as athletes that can motivate us in the same way um i'm just spitballing here i mean if you're asking the actual question oh, um true. you know a lot of athletes have had adverse experiences that a family member a friend they do it for their mom they do it for i mean you think of like chop wood carry water his brother you know was in an accident right and so he did it more or less be, to achieve both of their dreams um i hear a lot of hey, remember the phrasing like you you don't shame the game like like the um, respect the game so like mm -hmm. the honoring the people who've come before you and all the things that they've done like you think of, pick a sport but you think of the greats you know that have come before you and how they've played and how they I mean, it's kind of like the game becomes this this overarching why that you don't want to shame or even your own team like to be a yankee for instance as much as i despise the yankees i love the history of that and what that stands for even if i don't like it sometimes so i mean those are those are some ideas um, I know that a lot of players that have foundations and other things that good causes that they donate to, the better they do as athletes, the more they can give back. I don't think everybody has this. I think that is a huge problem and maybe differentiates between average to good to great. Who knows? Sure. Um, so I'm actually going to stick internally here and not look externally for wise. I'm actually going to focus on internal wise here because I'm not a huge goal setter. Okay. I'm an athlete who's not a huge goal setter. Never have been. Uh well, Jake, where do you see yourself in a year? Um, <laughs> I have no idea. That's largely out of my control. Okay. Um there's a lot of other people in this world who are making decisions that do impact me. Right, right, wrong or otherwise. That's just what happens. So how do I get to a place in a year? where I look back and I have no regrets. Okay. As athletes Ooh. in particular, we can tend to have a lot of regrets from simple things of you know rehashing a game saying, man, I wish I would have done X in that moment, or I wish I would have done Y in that moment, to oh, I wish, you know, I wish I would have taken a chance and joined that team. Or, you know, I, I wish I would have played for that coach or um or we get done playing we're like ah, you know i wish i could have played five we, we have a lot of regrets as athletes um as we go forward so what is our why that's going to get us to a point in a year in six months we're going to look back and say yep i don't have any regrets because okay. to me when we talk about discipline and we, discipline equals freedom well freedom from what Ooh. right as athletes what are we looking for freedom from I think it's a big question that we have to ask ourselves. We want discipline. Okay, great. Discipline. We get freedom. Freedom from. I, I think this this is a I mean, when we're staring at this as a block up to success, is like knowing you did the best you're capable of becoming. I think that is one that is haunting. I mean, because your career is gonna end. I mean, we talked about that before, and it's not if, it's just when. Sometimes it's sooner, sometimes it's later um that's an interest because it because it harkens to is it clear or is it greg McEwen? it's like it's kind of breaking your goal thing but if you have an end in mind it tells you what you do in the next 10 minutes and you don't need this stuff in between if you have a solid end in mind and it tells you what the next 10 inches are 10 inches 10 minutes 10 whatever you know the day and it's really easy to get caught into here but like you said there's a lot of variance there I think if you have those bookends right now out here, if those are strong, it's a lot easier to navigate. Because all you have to do is look up, be like, nope, wouldn't do that. And then you just put your head back down, up, down, up, down. And you look at the peak, you look and step in front of you. I think a lot of people do love to plan. So I'm not, I'm, yeah. I'm not going to go in to disagree with you about goal setting right now. We can fight yeah. about that another time. Um, but that's assuming... Um, people don't have these i don't know why i'm holding it like this maybe i should this way whatever yeah that is interesting so freedom from what and it's and i think it's the idea of a life of 
uh, or a career or a decision of a lack of regret and regretting that you would have. It's kind of like, remember when we started this series with Lou Gehrig versus Babe Ruth? Lou, Lou Gehrig had no regret and he got everything out of himself he could. Whereas Babe Ruth, not only the end shamefully, I mean, it's like just his life, but we look in his career and see how much he did and how much more he could have done. So I think a lot of the things that you say a why is how little can I leave on the table? Yeah, that's another that. way, another way of rephrasing it. Yep, I completely agree. You, I think you picked up what I was going to get to. Um, it is a regret, right? And so I fully understand that people set goals. I would never knock anyone who sets goals. I'm just telling you, that is not how my brain operates. That's not how, this is never how I've been wired. Uh, and so, you know, you get into the professional world and, and I kind of make a joke of it now at this point in time. Like, where do you see yourself in five years? I don't freaking know, man. I have no idea. There's so many things that could happen. I could have triplets between now and then, and that's going to completely change my life. So I, there's just there's so many things here that I I don't know, right? Um, now there are certain people that like, no, I want to be here in five years, and they're driven by that. Totally understand that. That's why the question came about, right? That's that's why the, that the question exists. So I get it. But a lot of people, and I've noticed younger people, are not necessarily massive goal setters. Okay. Certainly the teams that I've been around, not huge goal setters. And so I've really tried to play around with this idea but of, you know, I'm not a huge goal setter, but I need to be driven by something. You're right. I need that bookend. And so I've stopped asking myself, what do I want to do in a year? And I started asking myself, who do I want to be in a year? Ooh. Okay. A year from now, who am I? Who do I need to be? Because I've often had the expression of, yeah, I don't really set goals. I'm just focused on being the best I, I can be each and every day and trust that that's going to lead me to the right spot. Totally fine answer. Super vague. And what is the best you every single day? You still need something to work towards. Um, and so I've started asking people the question, what's the one thing you need to change about yourself? So that in six months from now, you're looking back, yep, I do this now. I am this. This would be something that someone would describe me as. And so I've started taking that approach. I would have the same message to athletes. A year from now, what type of player do you want to be? What do you want to be known for? Okay. Um, and, and it can go role specific if that's where your mind is, because that's going to, it's going to define and, and bring discipline to how you work out, to how you train, to how you practice. But I would actually encourage you to go deeper than that into the personal side of things. How do you want to carry yourself on the field or the court? How do you want to, um, I mean, what what do you want the coach to describe you as? Do you want the first thing to be out of his mouth? Oh, he or she is a great three-point shooter. Or do you want he or she is really disciplined during practice, always listening, first in line, um, always focusing on good technique? things like that. So I would encourage people to find the person that they want to be in six months to a year and then act accordingly. This is who, this is who I am. Yeah. And I, I'm going to go off script um, for this and just layer in one of these other um, thoughts at number 42 on my account about binary code. And I talked about binary wooden and there's a, I'm going to layer in. That was a really good, really good section, by the way. I was like taking all the notes of all your questions is, you know, who do I want to be in a year? And, and Mark Manson in the subtle art talked a lot about just defining yourself in very mundane, simple ways. Like you, you don't need to be, you know, this grand thing. Um, and I'll, I'll come back to um, the two words that I kind of played around with adjectival and adverbial. But binary code, Jocko, he says, machines make their decisions based on binary code, yes or no. It is not complicated. Are you going to work out? Yes or no. Are you going to get up? Yes or no. And he says, this is not complicated. And sometimes you have to put yourself into this binary mode, binary decision making. Are you going to be weak or strong? Are you going to be healthy or unhealthy? Are you going to improve your life? Are you going to make it worse? Are you going to sacrifice long-term success for ha, short-term gratification? You know the right answers. You know the right decisions. Don't overcomplicate binary decision making. 
make the right decisions. So to layer back, I, I toggle that with binary, you wouldn't. The idea of, are you going to be industriousness or, or industrious or not? Are you going to be enthusiastic or not? Are you going to have self-control or not? I mean, it's, you know, you pick, you know, you know, you're the culture guy where you say, pick your values. Did what you just did represent us? Yes or no? I mean, it's not complicated. There's just really right there. And I don't think always this is the case for the record. But when I say, how do you want to carry yourself? We'll define that. And then is what you're doing, doing that. So to layer this back in, you know, as I'm looking at podcasting, writing, all these things that, you know, trying it out, experimenting, play testing, like what's your voice? The one I came back to is I originally was going to go with, you know, the adjective or adverb of one of my signature strengths, which is creative, but that felt very restrictive. So it's like, what am I doing? I'm teaching. You know what? All I really want to do is teach playfully. That's it. I'm going to laugh. I'm going to have fun. I'm going to make a meme, whether they are going to fit the algorithm or not. But long term, that goal post at the end is like, are you teaching playfully? Are you having fun? And it doesn't matter what I teach along the way. Heaven knows we could be on Wooden in five years or Via or whatever the heck it is. <laughs> but all along the way, it's like you're going to teach playfully. And that's mundane. It fits the oatmeal, the origin. Um, and then because I would regret not doing that and taking on some persona that's not me. I'm not Jocko. I'm not going to pretend to be. So any thoughts before we move on to on the binary code, binary Wooden or... Anything else about wise? Uh, no, I love the binary code, man. I, we overcomplicate so many things in life. I've just come to this realization, and and the more you can simplify it, life, more you can simplify it, your goals, more you can simplify who you want to be, the easier life is. The easier things are to keep track of. The easier it is to to gain understanding and knowledge about yourself, about the world around you. So. Yeah, I, I think binary code is a great way to put it, but keep it simple. Keep it simple. Okay. Uh, I'm going to jump down here to number eight on our list. Uh, fight, default, aggressive, the warpath, and draw fighter. All right. This for self-control is interesting. So back in industriousness, I, I did a video on the first two seconds of flow. and that initial getting into the state and there and it's you know it's parallels to ptsd and other things but one of the key takeaways from that is that you have to lean in and take action and self-control needs that lean in you lean into the discomfort you lean you know despite all that stuff around you um, what I was impressed with with Jocko, and there's four prompts here. These are four separate, separate um, sections and write-ups that all more or less had the same thing: fight, default, aggressive, the war path, draw fire. And so I'm going to read just a couple of my highlights, and and it, it just speaks to the fact that if we're having self-control and we've really narrowed down to the things we're doing you need to be this on default because it's when you don't default aggressive is when things get get to be an issue so fight is the first one he says go down swinging and i'll tell you if you fight with all you have more often than not you won't go down at all you will win but you have to make that attitude i like that a part of your everyday life do the extra repetition run the extra mile go the extra round make the right choices give the full measure michael easter would call this be a two percenter Fight against weakness, fear, time, decay. Fight back. Go down swinging. Give every day everything you've got. Um, you have nothing to lose. That was fight. A couple pages later is default aggressive. I just think that I, I wrote a big heart next to this because this is so cool. Um, the idea is it doesn't mean like you're confronting people physically or mentally head on and without a, like, a tactically superior plan. But it do And it doesn't mean you go straight forward into conflict without thought and reason. Um, what it does mean is that you are going to get after it. As Jocko says, you are going to move fast. You're going to think fast. You're going to outthink and outmaneuver the enemy. If I think the enemy is going to attack me, I'm going to attack them first. I don't view aggression as an outward attitude. Uh, you were on spot earlier about inward. I view aggression as an internal character trait, a fire in your mind that says, I am going to win. 
So it's not blind aggressive, but an internal mind aggressive. And he says, aggression is to me the unstoppable fighting spirit, the drive, the burning desire to achieve mission success using every possible tool, asset, and strategy and tactic to bring about victory. It is the will to win. Two more. The war path is a little bit later. <laughs> It kind of speaks to fight plus default aggressive. It just repackages it. But he says the war path means moving toward a battle, a fight toward war. It's a war against ignorance, weakness, confusion. And the note I made here was, was okay, what are you warring against? I think people need more things, even if they're contrived, like some sort of, I don't know, superficial made up bad guy in the super better lingo you need something to war against like let's just make up something you can clearly tell a difference when people have a, something to fight against versus nothing to fight for at all and so even making them up as you go if you're playing a team that's not as good as you will making up this new challenge this new enemy that we have to go after fighting that being aggressive um is really interesting so the war path was fun and then the drawing fire uh, was another part of that mindset, but specifically within battle that he said, sometimes bad things happen. And you cannot stop it. So what do you do? Do you get angry? Do you get negative? Do you fall apart? Do you fall down? It's a spiral, but he's, but Jocko says you got to lead. So you step up, you be the one people, people look to, you absorb the impact when you're drawing fire and the negativity, draw fire. Yes. Draw fire. Bring that pain to me, he says. I can handle it when others cannot. When bad things are happening, I will be the one good thing. Standing tall, that can be relied upon. And that is the ultimate victory, to hold your head high and even in the face of inescapable defeat, to stand and fight. So we have fight, default aggressive, the war path, and drawing fire. And all these had that similar theme of not even just leaning in, but running it, like bring it. And because not everybody around you is going to. So what do you think about self-control and the idea of lead, not, fighting in, aggressively fighting in and going on the war path? I think it's the mindset that is um, that society is currently at war with. And I think a lot of it comes from not truly really understanding really not understanding it um you know these are obviously have to do with the violence with war these words right um so they have that connotation to them but it's a mindset that we can we should have as athletes to get the best out of us you want to talk about regrets um i think a well, big regret is not being a first person to act not being a first person to do i think about kobe bryant <clears throat> i'm trying to remember who it was um, it was some young guy who got drafted and got to the, the practice facility early, thinking that he was the first one there. And he gets there, and Kobe's there already. Jeez, dude, it's like it's 5 o'clock in the morning. I have this guy beat me already. And not only did he beat him, but he had already gotten, you know, I don't know the exact number, 250 shots and 500 shots and whatever. He's already full and sweating, and this guy's just rolling into the gym thinking he's hot stuff that he's, he's going to get there. Uh, first, um, you know what? I think it was Jay Williams, Jay Williams, point guard from Duke. And so then Jay starts his workout, getting up shots, looks over the other side of the court. Kobe's still doing his thing. What's this guy doing? Jay keeps doing his workout, keeps doing it. Eventually gets to the end of his workout, looks across the gym. Kobe Bryant's still doing it. He's, he's still putting up shots. He's still sweating profusely, still doing this his thing this guy beat me he's working out longer than me what what is going on to me that perfectly encapsulates kobe just had an aggressive fight war path attitude i'm going first i'm going harder this is the battle yes you're just showing up to work out but i'm showing up here to work up harder than you i'm here showing up saying that I will do whatever I have to take to beat you, even in this thing. It's going to be longer. I'm going to do it harder, etc. I think it's such a uh, good example of an aggressive mindset that we don't necessarily think about, right? It's not just for the game. It's in everything in life. We take it 
is almost a mini competition or we take it um, as something that we're battling some someone else at. The other point that I want to make that I thought was very interesting that you brought up is choosing your enemies. Who you mm. choose as your enemies in life will make you or break you. What you choose to go to war against will make you or break you. And we oftentimes view as, you know, who we're fighting for. But when you fight for something, understand there's probably an opposite side that you're fighting against. And if you don't understand that, um, it can lead to challenges. So what, I will say what, not who, but what you choose as your enemy is vitally important to self-discipline. It, it can be a big why. Like who you're fighting against or what you're fighting against is a big why for people. It's a big motivating factor. So fully understanding what you're going to war against is is huge. Yeah, I would agree that the Mamba mentality, which I have not read, I have I've have it, I think, in my Kindle right now because it was either free or super cheap one time. I really want to look at when we get to either condition like the mental condition or even confidence. It's a mindset thing, right? Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree that it does fit here. And that if in the reason why it matters for self-control, let's get back to our theme is just for me, because I'm out here right now is if you have that internally and you have the attitude, the mindset, and then you've designed something to fight against, it's a lot easier to develop the inertia to overcome this other gunk it just it pales in comparison right that's so small in the context of this you're like what and that's what mark was getting at and that's what bowen was getting at in the complaint free world you know that's what akira was getting at in chop wood carry out water is like no and none of that like i mean when you choose the f's you give it's like if you have that thing and this attitude and this becomes default it is not difficult. I mean, it's not even a discussion. I think that's why Jocko can be so cut and dry because he's got all of that lined up. Those self control wires just humming along. And it's like it, even slowing down to even consider that. I think that's what a society is just so taken aback by him. He's, he doesn't even slow down to think about this. It's not even a discussion. And everybody wants to talk about all that. It's like, why? I mean, he just hit yeah. and they drag him into it. And he's just, I mean, you can, I love his like furrowed brow look because he just doesn't even deal with that yeah. um so i agree with you that I, I one thing that you said that i i, I haven't even ever considered was the war path like choosing an enemy choosing your enemies well i love that visual or like because we're really into halo call of duty like the video game fortnite where there's a lot of that i mean there's a lot of i mean it's historical but there's a lot of appeal to that and so i would i would love to as a coach environmental design matters for self-control we know that from willpower we know that from decision fatigue we know that i would love to see what that looks like to design quickly ease not quickly because i don't want to go short conversion but have the skill set to frame things in that context for an athlete day by day week by week across a season is fascinating so i would love to even get into the mind of jacko like how did they design missions and adopting that mindset down uh, and packaging it in that way. Because then instead of expecting the athletes or even yourself, let's say, to take on that mindset, it's kind of hard, right? I mean, we, we all didn't go through SEAL training and go to Afghanistan. And so we can't expect that we're going to be on the war path and seeing an enemy. Ah, But if you package that way, there's no other way to see it. You didn't even ask if you wanted to see it that way. You just put it in that context. Mm -hmm. so i i would have to spend i want to sit with that because that's yeah. an interesting way to go about it i'm not i i'll be honest i have complete ignorance on what a mission looks like you know for a navy seal group in ramadi i have no idea i yeah. would love to see the structure of that and like how they you know because that was even in stealing fire by jamie wheel and stephen kotler is the navy seals were the epitome of group flow Mm -hmm. in terms of who you know having different leaders step up when it's needed that entire section to open that book was phenomenal so really good point i i'm fascinated by this whole enemy and mission concept it's super cool yeah i mean it's it's amazing how much an enemy can force you into self-discipline and keeping your eye on the goal i'm at 
of recently, well, not recently, I've always been fascinated by World War II. And anytime a new World War II movie comes out, um, I really want to go see it. There is currently a show that's airing on Apple TV called Masters of the Air. Um, and it's yeah. about um, be a, a, a group of pilots and crews that fly B-17 bombers um, over enemy land, right? Um, <laughs> and their clarity on who their enemy was was so powerful that it caused them to repeatedly get into metal tubes, fly them up into the air, fly over enemy territory, knowing that they were going to get shrapnel just blasted at them. And the enemy fighters were going to come and shoot at them. And they, you know, the the rule was they had to fly 25 missions before they got sent home, right? They had to complete their 25. Um, and obviously they had to win the war. But every time they went, they're seeing their friends come home, bloody, dead, shrapnel in them, all of this horrible, horrible stuff. Yet their clarity on who their enemy was focused them so much that they were willing to get back in that metal tube and fly it over their land again to drop bombs. Um, so the power of who your enemy is, is 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 immense. And I'm not just saying, hey, we show up to the game, there's the other team, that's the enemy. No. As you're developing as a player or an athlete or a coach, what's the thing that you don't do well? That's your enemy, right? Like, I can't shoot a three-pointer to save my life. That's my enemy. <laughs> I'm going to war. Gets that enemy. How do I defeat it? By shooting three pointers well, right? It it creates a new self discipline and a new motivation uh, intrinsically that is very valuable. You know, like the uh, man, we are never going to get through any very many topics today. It's going to be one of those episodes. <laughs> Dang it! Um, do you remember like the FBI's most wanted list and like you know the thing and like when they they the, say they were eliminated, whatever? It'd be so cool to to capture and i'm i'm running off on a tangent but like when in terms of self-control it, it'd be cool to create these enemies like the bad guys if we want to take super better sure across the season like who did we battle who did we take out or who did we beat and just to see those over time because it, it paints a different story we talk a lot about in memories making memories a lot of it's the stories we tell ourselves. So to look back at sixth grade, I'm just making this up, sixth grade basketball. We didn't beat the three point, you know, fee, you know, for 10 games. But then that 10th game, we got him. We hit that mark, whatever the mark is. And it's all contrived. And I like that. And it's creative. It's fun. It has to be something beyond the person next to you. Mm -hmm. I agree with that, to, to, to yep. be fair. And to go on that war path, it, what people are willing to do when they have that shared mission and goal and enemy is unbelievable. I think that's your point about that series. I did not know you had such a fashion fascination with World War II. I think it's been, you know, come up a couple times, but I didn't put the two and two together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's it's amazing. It, yeah, Band of Brothers highlights the exact same thing. Just what they were willing to go through because they all had a common enemy uh, and they knew who the enemy was and they're very clear on it. Is amazing to me, absolutely amazing. Okay, let's keep moving. Um, I'm going to drop down to 15. This is probably the one I'm most curious about. Me versus me, or the only time you can look back. Oh man, this this is another way of the you're building your own house from chop wood, carry water. Yeah. By the way, it is my mission to reference almost every episode we've ever done in the series, and. Maybe it's just a thing, but I'm drawing connections. So what is me versus me? So this one is the only time you can look back in that. And I, I wrote that as my note. It's interesting. It's, it, Jocko, I'm going to skip the first part. Is, is, is right here. It says, no, I will look at others who do achieve greatness in a category. And I will say, like Jocko, look at what is possible. How close can I get to that greatness? It kind of is the Ryan Holiday, choose your, you know, choose your Kados. How close can I get to that glory? But my glory 
it doesn't happen in front of a crowd. It doesn't happen in a stadium or on a stage. There are no medals handed out. It happens in the darkness of the early morning in solitude where I try and I try and I try again with everything I have to be the best that I can possibly be better than I was yesterday, better than people thought I could be better than I thought I could be faster and stronger and smarter and claim one victory that no one can ever take from me away from me ever a victory is as earned every single day, a victory of determination and will and discipline, a victory achieved because I will not stop. And what I drew from that is, is the only time you can look back is you, you kind of mentioned this in the future tense when you talked about goal setting. I'm changing this and looking backward in saying, you know, Stephen Adler talks about this in The Art of Impossible. When you get these aligned curiosities, passion, purpose, autonomy, or curiosity, passion, purpose, autonomy, and mastery, when you get your stack set up correctly and then your daily checklist, your impossible checklist, if you get that right and you just hack away, you chop wood, carry water, eventually you get to the end of a year and you look back and you're like, whoa, I made it somewhere. And so the only time you can look back, so I'm 34 as we record this, is I just arbitrarily looked back and said, okay, 25 years old. And I asked these questions. Am I better than I was then? And if I am, how? And it, those are not comfortable answers when you start piecing apart the different arenas, right? Financially, self-control, physically, I mean, whatever, socially, emotionally, you pick it. And you, you can really, you can't expect yourself to noticeably better at everything. Like, I mean, I don't want to say like, oh, you're a complete human being. But the metrics you're choosing to say, I'm deliberately trying to move the needle here. Compare yourself to that. And so we often see these photos of, you know, when you're a kid, when you're in high school to today, I'm reminded of that. I was in a school recently and a kid asked me, hey, you know, how come you dyed your hair? I'm like, dude, I didn't dye my hair. It's just gray. <laughs> <laughs> kid had not a lot of EQ. I ah, was a good kid. Um, give him a high five. I was like, appreciate it. I was, uh, so I asked him the question, should I dye my hair? He's like, absolutely. And I said, how about absolutely not? Anyways, but the me versus me and, you know, really running your own race and, you know, being better than you ought to be. I, and I, the only other point I want to make out of this is, is for coaches. Something that's been bothering me recently is my own self hypocrisy or hypocrisy and then coaching hypocrisy is you really can't expect your athletes to be something that you're not. And I'm not saying you're going to be at peak physical condition but you can't be peak no condition. I mean, you, I mean, you know, I shared a post with you a long time ago about being a shadow of yourself and how some dads and coaches are just a, a, a wisp of what they were mm -hmm. and how that degrades your example. And so I think of me versus me and the coaching professional development world and athletes is like, you don't have to be perfect, but you do need to be getting better mm -hmm. in some way. and. Mm -hmm. I think we disqualify ourselves. You you could probably name the verse is like don't do things that disqualify your testimony or your you know your witness. Mm -hmm. And I see a lot of people disqualifying themselves at the door in all sorts of ways. And I don't mean to you know take away for anybody that's struggling physically or you know emotionally. A lot of people have stuff going on. Um, I agree with that. That said, there's a lot of room for improvement, <laughs> and I'm the first person at that door. This has been a very hard. Um, series and very good topic for me as of late um yeah what do you think about me versus me looking backwards um and the only time you can look back is looking at where you were yeah well first of all to kind of your last point i think well, let's not kid ourselves we are not in this discussion as someone who's figured it all out or people <laughs> who figured it all out as coaches or athletes and we're we're sharing our proven testimony of how we've done things back to you rather we're we're pulling out resources and we're learning and we're sharing what we're learning and as we go through this and as we dialogue you know, a lot of, of my comments are <clears throat> almost in the moment what i'm learning <laughs> and and not necessarily what i've already learned that i'm trying to share so i want to be clear on that um i think it kind of ties into you know not only should you know your enemy but you should pick your friends wisely too um you know here here 
and kind of why I, I preface that statement with what I did in terms of you know being very clear of who we are is you, you should listen to people who have been there and done it before right it doesn't if if you want to be wealthy or or you know, attain wealth in life it doesn't make much sense to listen to someone who has no wealth right you'd want to go to the people who have attained wealth and say how did you do it what happened what are some pointers so um it, it's important to pick our friends right your your kados as, as you put it um of of the people that you do want to be and, and would seek to be an ally right they may be unattainable because you know they're billionaires and you know i want to be the next elon musk well probably won't have a chance good chances you won't have a chance to be able to sit down with elon musk and have a conversation but um trying to pick up from things like you know that whether it's in his speeches it's what he writes whatever uh of trying to pull things like yeah i like that about him that's what i want to do so that goes <clears throat> No, I've kind of hand in hand with who you pick as your enemies. Okay, hold on. I gotta I gotta get a big cough out. I got something stuck. One second. Oh, we're good. Yeah, and so when we first started recording this, um, wouldn't in the you know, peak performance and the pyramid of success, we like rated each of these and that was a while ago. Holy cow. Um, you know, and I, I look at this almost like a report card. The one that, you know, can evolve. You can go up, you can go down. It's just kind of a general check and uh my hope would be that as as you learn about them and you're clear about okay, this is what this actually means, or this is a little bit deeper into here's the the principle and here's how you know do do you meet these criteria on that rubric um, that you're just a little bit better and maybe you have to give and take. Okay, I'm focused on self control and enthusiasm right now. Okay, well let's move those up until they get pretty solid and you know secure, and then let's work on some other ones. But coughing good. Yeah, love it, love it. I'm, I'm good now. Um, and then looking back, uh, I'll take this to an athlete perspective because there's, there's such a good balance here. I would spend times before games. There's a balance, right? I was visualizing what I was expecting to have to do in the game, and I was also remembering the times that I had succeeded in the past, right? To kind of prep my brain and my body for the things I was going to have to do, and remind it that it can do the things that it's going to need to do right so that everything would feel more comfortable and feel more prepared so there's absolutely something of yes we want to look forward to the person that we desire to be but also be able to look back and remember either one right look how far i've come or look i've done this before uh and so i am prepared to do it again it's a, it's a tremendously vital mindset yeah, and the only thing I want to add on this before we move on is uh, I've been really pondering. This is we're in March of twenty four. Professional development for coaches. I know we haven't talked at length about this yet. Um, I don't pretend to have a monopoly on Wooden or any of these other concepts. I, clearly, I'm just trying to learn from people who like Jocko and Ryan Holiday who've been there. It's like, okay, well, what can we learn from that? And then, okay, let's drag that from their world and put it into the coaching world and athletic world and whatnot. But I've been really thinking a lot about the coaching arena. And there are certifications out there. And I don't want to take away from certifications, but I've heard of plenty of certifications that are like, yeah, it's just a piece of paper and I did it because it allows me to do this. And so when I think of coaching, not that what you and I are doing is is the pinnacle of improvement. I've been thinking a lot about a coaching community where it's like, okay, you've coached for 10 years are you better? It's the idea of, did you teach 10 years the same way or did you teach 10 different years? Like where mm -hmm. each one got a little bit better. And I've been thinking about that quite a bit on walks lately is I would love to be in a community like that. And you don't have to do Wooden's pyramid. You don't have to, but if you picked virtues, values, things that you want to learn and you left a trail of evidence of here's the things I've done, and you don't have to read necessarily read books. I'm I would be biased to say you should read books because it's the most condensed information. It could be audible, it could be whatever. But if you're reading and you're growing and you're watching movies and you're creating something, whether it's a paper, a podcast, a toolkit, a you know, a PowerPoint, or what have you, I don't care. Over time, five years, ten years, thirty years to get to that poetry, that's something. 
I mean, you talk about that example, I, and I'm not suggesting we're the again the pinnacle of an example here. Uh, but how? Uh, otherwise, the question I want to point in the ass is: How do you know you got better? Your team won state; they got fourth place, third place. Does that make you better or worse as a coach? So now you're tying your value and your progress as a person to an external thing that is quite out of your control. So you won six state titles instead of three. Yeah, I mean, okay, you got a formula, okay. But are you better? You know, are you still growing? And Brandon Geyer talked about this recently is is, is being uncomfortable being comfortable or being uncomfortable with being comfortable. So mindfully noting like, oh, what? I'm not growing. I need to push myself. Let's get on the warpath. And so I've been thinking about a lot about that is that coaching community of where are people doing stuff like this? Who, those are my people. I mean, like, I want to be around people who are like learning and growing and teaching. And there's really not a lot of secrets in the game when you get down to it. It's, can you do the fundamentals better, stronger, faster than others? Yeah, you can learn some strategies and where to put your hands and your feet and this and that. Like that all matters. But I think it matters more is like, who are the coaches as people? If you don't have self-control, will your athletes? No. And that, they've already shown that. Parents who don't have growth mindset, their kids don't. So to, I think the biggest ROI at this point is, is who are you as a coach, as a person that will immensely reflect the people in front of you. So if we're going to, I mean, I, I originally thought, oh yeah, let's put it all into athletes. I would, you, I'm almost sort of the convinced as of this point that the best thing that you can do to get the best out of your athletes, the key lever is the coaches, who they are themselves. There's my rant. Coaching community, done. <laughs> Um, yes, there there has to be a genuine leadership. I will say this day and night. Leadership has to be genuine. It has to be from your heart. You have to believe it. It's awfully tough to get your team to fully buy into being the most fit team in the league and you not be have fitness at the top of your priority list. It just comes off as ingenuine and there's going to be less buy-in, right? Um, anywho, let's... Let's uh, let's jump down to uh, the last point here. We'll start wrapping up. Um, let's find out. I I like this. This is good. There's I'm gonna put two together. Let's find out and um, do. It's the end of the book. And do every. I know I always say it every episode. Go get the book. I mean, there's so many things that we can't cover because of time, and um, you get a full picture. And what you take out of it may be different from what we take out of it. Um, but all this is, is just fun. It's, that's probably the hardest part about doing any episodes on anything is, is, uh, you just hope that you can do the topic and the author and the book justice. So we give it a go. So the last point, let's find out. I like this because it's igniting the seeking system of effective neuroscience. We kind of that, you know, that, I don't know, pick your explorer of the world, people who found worlds and, you know. You know, you just the terrain, right? Being going out west, you know, but like we have this thing, like we want to figure out, like we want to see what it's like. And that I like that, that this comes out of this. So let's find out, Ari. What would happen, Jocko says, if you implemented unmitigated daily discipline in your life? What would happen if you stopped procrastinating? What if you lined up tasks and smashed them? God's a good word. What if you aggressively and unmercifully pursued your goals? Where would all that end up? Would you be guaranteed to win? Is victory assured? I don't know. I don't know how it ends up. I think I know the answer, and I think you know. But there is only one way to confirm that answer, and that is by executing those things. So let's find out. And I'm going to just wrap up with the end, too, while we're here, because it's similar in nature. But the way he ends the book, and it's just the word do. He said, don't just read this book. Don't just listen to the podcast. Don't just watch videos online. Don't just take notes. Don't just study them. Don't just share them with your friends. Don't just plan. Don't just mark your calendar. Don't just get motivated. Don't just talk. Don't just think. Don't just dream. No, none of that matters. The only thing that matters is that you actually do. So do. So as we wrap up, Jake, let's find out and do. Where does that leave you with self-control goals and finding out what do you want to find out and um 
what'd you like? I mean, we talked a lot about a lot of things, the wave discipline, why default aggressive me versus me. But what do you think about let's finding out and, and using our self-control to get somewhere? Yeah, doing it, it's, I mean, that's what it all comes down to. That's what self-control is. You're, you're always doing something, even if you're doing, you're sitting on the couch, <laughs> still doing something, right? And so self-control is really replacing those things and doing things that you know you should be doing that your brain is telling you it doesn't want to do. And I want to say I just heard a Huberman snip where there's a part of your brain that gets activated when you do something that you don't want to do. And the more you do it, the bigger that part of the brain gets. Mm -hmm. um, and it leads to more resilience. It leads to being tougher. It leads to a lot of, of positive things um, neurochemically. Um, so, I mean, it's just, there's so many things that, that self-control and discipline when you do those things, despite not wanting to do them, uh, just the health benefits that come from it, the, the, I mean, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, um, I mean, this whole time, you know, it never dawned on me till this morning when you say discipline is freedom, right? Um, discipleship is freedom. It, it's such a biblical idea to me that when you engage in true discipleship, the way the Bible lays out, you get the freedom that it speaks about, the freedom from sin, the freedom from oppression, the freedom from all of the negative things that the world throws at you. Um, and I think you can even take that outside of the Bible because a lot of what we talked about, whether people know it or not, are biblical principles. Um, so, yeah, the, but the doing is where rubber meets road, right? That's why, that's why self control self-discipline is so tough because you have to do it <laughs> despite what your brain is telling you, you the, the members of your body still have to move to do the doing um, unfortunately that's where most people slip up so I encourage everyone to be tougher right don't dwell on it do it you want to be tougher then be tougher that's what i'm taking away it's still something that I'm after. I would echo everything you've said about this being the most challenging and convicting section that we've done. It's a thousand percent for me too, man. Absolutely. That's right. That's right. And you can see why, I, you know, I, I haven't gotten to the point. Maybe I will at the end. You know, I heard that wouldn't like rearrange these at some point. Like how did you select what went where? You know, this is on that second level. So there's the first five and then this is the first one on the left. I, there's no way you can be successful in wooden sense of the term without self-control. I mean, there's no debate how valuable this is. Um, and I, I think that it's one that I'm going to keep coming back to because kids at the stage that I've been exposed to on the front end of middle school, upwards of college, they don't have this yet, right? So we have to be able to model it and teach it. And the absence of self-control is devastating. And I, you know, when I, when we read this last section of let's find out, you can't find out if you don't have this. And so I would hate to be, you know, have regret hearkening back to the previous points you've made. I would hate to have the regret because I didn't have this, you know, it's like, Oh man, I, I couldn't, you know, kind of like a Babe Ruth regret. I couldn't get there because I was too stuck here. I would rather get rid of all the gunk and, and just dive in, like you said, and do to be able to see what's on the other side. It's like, well, fine. Like, if that's what I got to let go to get there, sure. It doesn't even become a debate then. And so I'd rather find out. And that I think I like that positive curiosity versus the negative of what you're missing out on. And, and I wrote that, you know, Ryan Holiday post of, you know, self-control, self-discipline is not deprivation. It is not a punishment. And so if we can get a wrangle on this and just be a little bit better than we were, we're going to be able to, you know, we going to be better at least um, and be able to find out and live a lot more regret and definitely a lot more freedom. So, all right, I'm going to wrap um, that. That's a wrap on self-control. So I just want to reread again, flashback, what we've come. 
Um, the first episode is Discipline is Destiny. The second was Mark Manson's Subtle Art. The third was Will Bowen's Complaint for Your World. Fourth was Chop Wood, Carry Water, Joshua Metcalf. And we wrapped it with Discipline Equals Freedom. Um, we do have other episodes in the playlist, Industriousness, Enthusiasm, Friendship, Loyalty, Cooperation. We are making headway, buddy. And, um, you know, we're going to be moving on to alertness. So the idea of being observing constantly, staying open-minded, being eager to learn and improve, looking at our unconscious and then moving into the present moment and our presence and then figuring out what, you know, body language and situational awareness look like before encapsulating that in an actual context where all of those things matter um, in the biggest bluff. So it's going to be fun. Tune in. Um, let us know what you liked. Um, like, subscribe, a whole deal, all that YouTube podcasting stuff. Um, let us know what you really need as a person um, or what you find valuable about this particular topic or any other resources maybe it's world war ii related i know jake will perk up at that world war ii plus self-control equals jake and uh it's been all good jake any final words before we say say goodbye bit ado uh no it's been a good section i'm i think that was a great lead into alertness uh it's definitely piqued my interest in some of the things that you said so uh looking forward to it um thanks everyone for listening and uh, that's all i got me too. Keep learning, everybody. See ya.